Would you make this a reality within your home? As for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. Now, jumping into today, today's message, I have a random question and it's going somewhere and I think everyone can relate to this, but show of hands, if you've ever had someone scratch your back, come on, at all of our campuses, if you've ever had someone scratch your back, yeah, okay, we can all relate to this. Now, show of hands, if you can relate to the experience where someone is scratching your back and somehow they keep missing the spot. Anyone else? And you're thinking to yourself, it's a four by four inch space on my back that I cannot touch. How do you keep missing it? So what do you do? A little to the left, a little to the right, and then eventually what happens? They hit the spot and your right leg starts to shake like a puppy. It's like, there it is. That's the spot. And I think today's message is gonna feel a lot like that. Paul is gonna say some things in the letter that he wrote to a church in Colossae. And he makes these broad strokes and he doesn't, you know, he's in no hurry. He's not trying to rush the idea. He is building his argument and he hones it over time. And as it ends, he zeroes in and I think he hits the spot. And know this, throughout today's message, chances are you're gonna think, what does this have to do with family? What does this have to do with my home and how does this support this declaration that I'm trying to make, that as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. But if you hang with me, Paul gets us there. Now, Paul's book to the uh, church in Colossae, known as the book of Colossians, is a short book. It's only made up of four chapters. And those four chapters break down into two categories. Now, this is a really important thing to consider. The first two chapters lay out theological truths. And then the second two chapters then expound on Christian virtue and Christ-like behaviors. And, And that's a really important thing to consider. What Paul is saying is his entire argument and how he builds out logic to his faith is I act this way because I believe these things. And my beliefs shape my behaviors. Here would be the principle. I would say that Christian virtue builds upon and is the byproduct of theological truths. And that's what Paul establishes in his argument. I'll say it again. Christian virtue, Christ-like maturity and behavior, it builds upon and is the byproduct of theological truths. And why is that important? Well, we now live in a time of history where we're seeing some new trends within the, in the body of believers in the community of faith where individuals bear the banner and claim to be Christians, but have dismissed uh, the firm foundation of God's written, inspired, infallible word. And that is a major error. And what happens is, is the moment you try to manufacture on your own uh, acts of righteousness, and Christian virtue, and you go throughout the, uh, the world trying to live as a Christian, yet not aligning to God's word, well, what does that do? That produces a, a wonky way of living that's unstable and contradicting to God's word because you claim to be a Christian, but you look nothing like Jesus. Anyone ever bumped into this person? Ever seen him in the mirror? Yeah, because we have this tendency to claim to be Christians, but then not act like Jesus. And so Paul is saying, if you don't understand the theological foundation to this faith, these beliefs uh, are what shape your behaviors. And you could get down the road confused and even unproductive in your life if you miss this. And Paul is is gonna say some remarkable things, but know this, and this is something to maybe discuss with your life group. In the first two chapters, Paul really establishes three things, and here's what I would write down if I were you to discuss. He uh, establishes the supremacy of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, and the sovereignty of Christ. My goodness, you get those three right, and you understand the foundational beliefs that those are, you're, you're gonna be heading in the right direction. The supremacy is this idea that God is above all things, before all things, and he reigns supreme. He's in full control, and he is the originator creator. He is supreme. He is sufficient in that he works his redemptive plan in and through every detail and aspect of our life. That our God is a good steward, and he doesn't waste anything. 
You want to thankful for a God who doesn't waste anything? Doesn't waste your time, certainly doesn't waste your pain, he doesn't waste your experiences, but somehow God in his faithful goodness weaves his redemptive plan in and through the minute details and the mundane natures of our life. And you look back on life and you discover that he's so good and he fulfills his promise that says he will bring to completion the work that he has started within you. He doesn't waste anything, he's sufficient. In addition to that, He is sovereign, meaning he's not just all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and always present. It means he's in full control, he has a plan, and he handles his business. And I think when it comes to God's sovereignty, it will create some doubts in every single one of us. To be a Christian is to live within the tension of beliefs and doubt. See, sometimes what happens in the church world is we create an idol out of certainty, The moment you become a Christian, you should no longer face any doubts. The moment you become a Christian, you should no longer have any questions. Well, that's nonsense, and it's nowhere represented in the Bible. Every individual who embarked on this life of faith anchored their life to some things they were confident in, yet they had to manage some uncertainty, and they had to manage some doubts. You think of the disciple Thomas who was in Jesus' inner circle, who at times had extreme faith. In fact, he had so much faith, he stood out from the other disciples. At a time where Jesus was deciding to go back to a town by the name of Bethany, the disciples let him know, well, hey, there's some folks back there who wanna stone you and want you dead. Maybe we shouldn't go back. And in that moment, Thomas rises up in courage and rises up in faith and confidence in Christ and he says, let's do it. If you go, I'm going with you and even if they take us out to the death, I'm with you. Now that's some faith, that's some belief. But after the resurrection, after he had just witnessed his Lord and his friend and his teacher and and his rabbi be publicly executed, humiliated and tortured, Suddenly he's wrestling with the complexities and the contradictions of his soul and and he has some doubt and fear creeps in and he is known as Doubting Thomas. But he is in the the tension of that. You're going to find yourself in the tension of belief and doubt. But know that our God is sovereign and faith is trusting in advance what will oftentimes only make sense in reverse. Let me say it again. Faith is trusting in advance what will oftentimes only make sense in reverse. That you get down the road and you realize faith is tracing the heart of God in the moments when you can't trace the hand of God. God, I don't know exactly what you're doing, but I know you're good and I know you're faithful. I know that you're for me and I know that you're merciful and and I know that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. But what happens is, is you get down the road and you pivot. And you turn around and you look back on life and what you realize in reverse is God's tender mercy and his faithful ability to be at work in all things. You don't see it looking forward, but my goodness, haven't you noticed it when you look back? That God, somehow you were in it all, you are sovereign. And Paul says, okay, now with this theological understanding, let's start to talk about how this should affect your lives and your relationships. Because being a Christian, what you discover is Jesus not only makes life better, there's a peace, there's a purpose, there's an identity, there's a joy, there's so much to Christ that makes life better. But he not only makes life better, he makes you and I better at life. Specifically, better at relationships. One of the overarching claims of scripture is if you follow Christ truly and faithfully, you will get better at your relationships. That God is so attentive and concerned with our relationships. Now, Paul says this in chapter three. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, which is what we're gonna celebrate next week at all of our campuses in terms of baptism. Individuals who are going public in their faith saying, I have laid to rest the old me and I am stepping into the new life with Christ. I am identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Baptism is wonderful because what it signifies is our faith is not just sacred, Well, I mean, it's sacred, but it's not supposed to be a secret. Or another way of saying it, it's personal, but it was never meant to be private. That what we do in baptism is we go public 
with our faith saying, just so everyone knows I'm with Christ. And he says, okay, if you're a Christian, which if you've surrendered your life to Christ, you confessed your sin, you acknowledged him as Lord and Savior, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, well, the book of Romans says, well, you are saved. Okay, well, that's your story. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your minds. Think about setting something. How do you set something? Place your mind onto things that are above, not on things that are on earth. He says, when you give your life to Christ, you take on a different posture, a, a different demeanor. You take on a different uh, perspective and you no longer obsess over lesser things because you're anchoring your hope, your vision, and your identity to the King of Kings who's seated on the throne. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are of earth, for you have died and your life, this is the big statement, is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, watch this, who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, now deep breath, we gotta unpack this a little bit. What Paul is saying is over time, what you start to discover is God's work in your life. And what you anchor yourself to is the future hope and glory of eternity that has been provided to us through Christ Jesus. And he's saying, as you give your life to Christ, you set your mind on things above. You set your hope and your faith and your trust on things above. And there's coming a day where Christ is going to return in the fullness of his glory. Now, this is super important for us to emphasize. And again, a great conversation for your life groups. Because again, there is this movement to think we're the editors of scripture. And so we can pick and choose what we like and what we dislike, what we believe in and what we don't believe in. And just know that that's a very, uh, well, it comes with a lot of fallacies if that's your approach to faith. And now there is this growing trend of Christians who no longer believe in the second coming of Christ. Folks, it's a major error. Prophets for centuries on end predicted and foretold and promised on behalf of God that the chosen one, the Messiah, the savior of the world would show up. And guess what? He showed up. Jesus Christ came and took on human flesh. This is the doctrine of the incarnation, essentially God in a bod. It's an amazing thing. And it signifies the great reversal. And what's the great reversal? He takes on your brokenness and gives you his righteousness. He steps into our shoes so we could step into his shoes. He takes on our death so we could take on his life. He becomes a part of an earthly family so we could join a heavenly family. I mean, this is not a fair exchange, but you and I are the benefactors and he is so gracious to us. And he says, no, that Christ will return. Folks, Christ will return. Upon his first re uh, arrival, what did he do? In some brilliant way, he marched to the cross. He takes two pieces of wood in the form of a cross, and he bridges the gap between humanity and its creator. And in that moment, somehow, some way, Jesus manages to punish sin, yet preserve the sinner. It's amazing. For centuries on end, people were terrified that the wrath of God had been foretold and promised. And at some point, God's gonna show up and deal with the sinfulness and the wickedness and the brokenness of humanity, which meant everybody was bracing for impact. And then Jesus shows up and he says, the kingdom of God is near and everybody's going into their storm shelters. Like here comes the wrath of God. And what no one expected was this Jesus to stand in between you and I and the wrath of God and to absorb every ounce of his wrath as a sponge and as a shield on your behalf and on my behalf. And he's gonna come again, triumphant and victorious, establishing once and for all his full and perfect creation where we will live in perfection, where there is no evil and there is no wickedness and there is no sorrow or mourning or weeping and there is no pain and there is no injustice Life will be amazing. And here's what he says. When Christ appears in the fullness of his glory, you too will also appear. But what does that mean? This is a wonderful promise, and this is what he's getting at when he says, your life is hidden 
in Christ. Now, to be clear, when he says your life is hidden, he's not talking secrecy. He's talking security. He's saying because of the finished work of the cross, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and your eternity rests assured in the vault of heaven. You have security. It is hidden in Christ. And when Christ returns in all of his glory, in that moment, God is gonna introduce every single one of us to our future version of ourselves. And he's going to introduce you to yourself at its fullest potential. Where there is no shortcoming and there is no brokenness. And that's a beautiful thing. This is the hope of the Christian. The hope of the Christian lives with this anticipation that God's gonna show up. God is redeeming all things. And the hope of the Christian reverse engineers their future into their present. If this is how my eternity is gonna look, if this is how I'm gonna act then, well, how do I pull that into the now? And it's an amazing word of encouragement because here's what you've discovered. We've all discovered this. You became a Christian and you had people in your life who were quick, quick to remind you that you're still broken after you prayed that prayer. Anyone else, you had some fruit inspectors in your life? It's like, oh, I thought you were a Christian, but you still lose your anger at your kids' sports games. Hey, I thought you were a Christian, but patience is still something you're working on. Yeah, because heaven doesn't wave a wand over your life the moment you surrender your life to Christ. That's salvation. But what does salvation trigger? Sanctification. Come on, track with me. Salvation will happen in a moment. Sanctification will take the rest of your life. Salvation gets you to heaven. Sanctification gets heaven through you. And it's this lifelong journey where our heavenly father is in no hurry to just check you off his to-do list. He's not concerned with the speed of your growth. He's concerned with the strength of your growth. And he just walks with us diligently over time, shaping us, building us, and transforming us into the image and the likeliness of his son, Jesus Christ. And Paul wants us to know, yeah, there's coming a point where you are going to discover and witness and become the full perfect version God had in mind when he created you. It's wonderful. Now with that in mind, he goes on to, well, actually I got this picture of an avalanche I wanna talk about. Because here's the thing about this. I grew up in Colorado and you learn a lot of things about the mountains. And one of the things you learn about is avalanches. And you hear of stories of avalanches. In fact, you hear of really devastating stories where people lose their lives in an avalanche. And here's what they say happens in an avalanche. They say the snow comes in at such a force and it tumbles the people. And so you get pummeled by all the snow. And what happens is, is because you are tossed to and fro, you become disoriented. You no longer know which way is up and which way is down. And they say a lot of people die in an avalanche climbing and crawling in the wrong direction. Thinking they're moving towards what is up, they're climbing further down. It's a sad thing. And I say that because Paul is establishing some truths for us to be governed by. And I think the same happens in our world. You are pummeled and disoriented by culture and all the things swirling about. And again, if you don't have an anchor point, and you don't have a true governing north in your life, you are going to exhaust yourself climbing, walking, and striving potentially in the wrong direction. So again, choose for yourself. But as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. That's the heartbeat. Now Paul would say this. So put to death. Now that's some strong language, which people always get offended when the Scriptures get firm. I would just say, be the type of person who doesn't just resist or turn the page or run from firm conversations in Scripture. Ask the question, why is God being so firm? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Dun, 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 right? Right? But again, you and I don't feel fear when we hear that statement. Why? Because our eternity is secured. This is why we should live with a motivation to share Christ with other people because we don't live in intimidation. 
We live with anticipation. Oh, I can't wait for the day. I don't have to fear my God. He loves me. He's for me. My eternity is secure. But the wrath of God is coming. Essentially, the word wrath means he is passionately and unyieldingly devoted to making things right. I, I, I love that. This is actually a good news, that our God is going to make things right. And my goodness, that's gonna be a wonderful day. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek. Watch this statement. Not Greek and Jew, Circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, that, that's a huge load of statement that we gotta get to. But what Paul is saying is if you're a Christian, you have put to death the old you. That's firm language. And here's the thing, what you find is our heavenly father isn't cute and doesn't wink at the things that harm his kids. So when God calls things out, it's not because God's trying to be mean and God is some cosmic killjoy. No, God is hard on the things that are hard on his children. And what does scripture say? For the wages of sin is death. Yeah, that's the book of Romans. In other words, it doesn't just lead to physical death you will find that as you just embark and develop and live in a way that is sinful and dishonoring to God, it will come at the expense of the things that matter most in your life. It'll kill your joy, it'll kill your peace, it'll rob your identity, it'll hijack your purpose, and it will kill your relationships. And what Paul is saying is, would you kill the things that are killing you? Do not flirt with destructive things that harm what matters most in your life. This is God saying, come on, come on, I have more in store for you. And he's saying, you put off the old and you put on the new. And he makes this statement, he says, and now because of Christ and because of the gospel and because of God's transcendent grace that bridges the gaps of our broken world, there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer barbarian or Scythian. There's no longer circumcised or uncircumcised. And there's no longer slave or free. What is Paul saying? He's saying, would you consider your society? Know this, that the gospel bridges the biggest gaps in your world. That's what he's saying. He's saying, because of Christ, there is no racial, political, social, economical distinction within our world. Because of Christ, he bridges the gaps, the biggest gaps that disrupt our world. He has a way of mending those divisions. I, I mean, again, the people of God stand ready and prepared to have a very tremendous impact on a very divisive and broken world if we truly embraced what God is saying here. So he goes on to tell us, he says, so put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, which have you ever had a complaint against somebody? Right, you ever had a complaint against the person seated next to you? Yeah. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. That's a loaded statement. Watch how he ends it. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. What a statement. That the grace of God, this love, it binds broken things. It reconciles divisions. It bridges gaps. And he says, would you put to rest the old you and would you step in and would you put on the new nature of Christ? And he provides some clarity. He goes on to actually list out some Christian virtues, patience and meekness and love and forgiveness and all these things. And here's the thing about these virtues. They are all relational virtues. See, here's where we're getting it wrong in our culture. 
We are becoming so autonomous. We are driven towards independence and we are becoming more and more isolated day by day. Everyone wants to be their own boss. Everyone's an influencer. We are the selfie generation and narcissism is on the rise. Don't worry about the world, just obsess over yourself. And here's the thing, side note, narcissism is one of the fastest growing and most lethal cancers your family could ever get. I'm just telling you, a family with a narcissist in it has some issues to deal with. And he's saying, no, what Christ does in and through our life plays out first and foremost through the context of relationships and community. And so again, you can tell how well you're doing in your relationship with Christ by how well you're doing in your relationship with others. And he says, forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you. Whoa, that's a big standard. You know, there comes this point, Matthew chapter 18, Peter comes to Jesus, he's like, all right, explain this forgiveness thing. You want me to forgive him seven times? And Jesus is like, no, like 70 times seven. And essentially, keep forgiving them until you lose count is what he's saying. And then he tells this parable. He's like, hey, there's this master and all these people owed him a debt. And there's this one guy who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Think about that. And the master meets with the guy and instead of punishing the guy, the guy pleads for his forgiveness and says, please let me pay it back. And the master has compassion on him and, for, uh, compassion on him and forgives his debt. Owes 10,000 bags of gold, and the master says, we're, we're good, move on. He walks out into the town, and he bumps into a guy who owes him 100 pieces of silver. And the guy turns around and sends that guy to prison. And the master hears about this, like, wait a second. I forgave you of 10,000 bags of gold, and you're sending that guy to prison for 100 pieces of silver? Okay, that's not okay. I need to hold you accountable. And he says some really uncomfortable things about how our God views unforgiveness in the hearts of his children. I think personally, and you can disagree with me, and that's fine, but I think the leading cause of hypocrisy within the church is unforgiveness. Guys, it just doesn't make any sense. Our message is the gospel, which is a message of grace, a message of forgiveness, and the most comical oxymoron is an unforgiving Christian. Someone who walks around with bitterness in their heart. No, if you are following Christ truly and faithfully, Christ would never lead you to a life of bitterness. He'll never support that. And so it is learning to forgive others. How? The same way Christ forgave me. Well, how did he forgive me? Well, scripture says, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. In fact, on the cross, Christ prayed for me. And he prayed for you. And what does he say? He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness before repentance. Forgiveness before an apology. In fact, forgiveness despite their ignorance. And he says, yeah, would you just forgive people like that? Would you be the type of Christian who carries some grace in your back pocket so when someone comes up short, you're just there to be some Jesus with some skin on? Hey, it's all, it's all all right. We're all fallen people. We all come up short, but God is good. God is faithful. He's forgiven me of much. And because of my experience, this expression is natural to me. That's how we're supposed to live. And it makes me think of some of the mission trips I've been on. I, I find myself immediately stressed out whenever I land in another country when it comes to the driving in other nations. Anyone ever been stressed out by someone else's driving? Yeah, like, it's a bad thing. I find that I'm not a good driver either. Recently, someone pulled up and flipped me off, honked the horn at me. I'm like, hey, I don't like what I'm doing either. I'm just, I'm trying to figure it out. And I take 69 to, to school every single day to drop my kids off. And I don't know if you take 69 here in Hamilton County, but... I find that probably 70% of the time there's a car accident. There's always a fender bender. I'm like, people cannot pay attention to taillights. Like, stop putting on your makeup, stop texting, stop yelling at the kids, just focus so we can all get there on time. <laughs> and then you go to other countries and they drive like maniacs. And I was in Thailand with a group and 
They put us in the back of this paddy wagon. And guys, I think we are going to die. And here's why I think we're going to die. This is what the traffic looked like. Look at this. Now, the driving is impressive, but check out the pedestrians. Like, that is jaywalking on a different level. And so the whole time I'm thinking, we're dead. And I'm talking to my buddy who lived in the States, became a missionary in Thailand. And I said, hey, we got to talk about the driving. What is that like? And he's explained it to me. And I said, what amazes me is you don't see any accidents. And he said, yeah, I wondered the same thing when I got out here. In America, we see accidents everywhere. Out here, there's just not a lot of accidents. And he said, but then I figured it out. He said, in America, we expect people to stay in their lane and we're surprised when they don't. But out here, we just expect people to come out of their lane and so we're ready and prepared for it. And I thought to myself, the same thing happens in the church. We become so cute and professional about our religion and we just start expecting perfection out of everyone. Everyone just stay in your lane and then the moment an imperfect person does something imperfectly, we're immediately shocked and caught off guard. Wait a second, you came out of your lane. Yeah, we all do. Folks, here's the deal. People are gonna let you down and newsflash, you're going to let them down. So you might as well be gracious to them because I know you're hoping they'll be gracious to you. And he says, be forgiving. And again, this is a handle. You wanna see who's honoring Christ? You wanna see who's living a life that is in step with Christ? They're living a life marked by forgiveness. And then he goes on to say this. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. One of the great commandments is thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. And certainly you can do that with your language and that's what most people think of. Don't take the Lord's name in vain with your language. Where I think we are guilty of taking his name in vain is our lifestyle. Not our words, but our ways. And Paul is saying, no, do everything. If you're gonna call yourself a Christian, do everything. And come on, I've come up short here. I've made some mistakes and it's just learned to say, in those moments, where do I need to repent? Where do I need to walk humbly? Where do I need to take ownership? How can I get it right? And Paul gives us a brilliant handle, a, a, a key to discerning complicated situations. And he says, let the peace of Christ rule your life. Have you ever found that you got into a situation and you're like, oh, it's so confusing. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's telling the truth? Who's at fault? What's the context? There's two sides to every story. How do I make sense of the situation? You ever found yourself in one of those situations? And what Paul is saying is, yeah, in those moments, you need to let the peace of Christ rule. Now, first off, when he's talking about peace, he's not talking about internal peace. He's not talking about a peace that is a remedy to anxiety. No, he's talking about, again, relational peace. And he's saying one of the greatest ways to discern your path forward is to pay attention to the peace factor. What is moving the situation towards peace? Who is moving the situation towards peace? And he's saying, yeah, you should let the peace of Christ rule. In other words, let it arbitrate, let it govern, let it decide, right? Now, Here's where Paul's at. Think of all the things he's established in his argument. Guys, God is supreme. He's sufficient. God is sovereign. That you and I have put the rest to old us. We have risen in Christ. We have now placed off anger and wrath and malice and slander and faults of integrity. Like, no, we don't lie. We don't do those things. We place all that aside. And now what do we do? We walk in meekness and humility and patience and forgiveness and and peace, and he's building this idea, and he's saying, again, there's no gap that the gospel cannot bridge. Barbarians, Scythian, Jews, Greeks, remember all that? So he's building this argument, and then he says this. Okay, 
What's the anchor point? Paul, what's your, what's the argument and the point you wanna leave us with? What's the end to your chapter? Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. And fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And you are serving the Lord, oh, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and do not, uh, and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. And you are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Okay. Here's the thing. There's agreement in the room when we talk about things at a high level. When things are at a macro level, it's like, yeah, heads nodding, amen, pastor. But the moment they move to a macro level, everyone gets uncomfortable. You ever found that to be the case? We're really good at talking about things on a large scale, but the moment you make them specific and apply it to our personal life, suddenly we're all uncomfortable, right? Like we can all solve the war in the Middle East, but we can't solve the conflict in our living room. We're all very comfortable in conversations about the Second Amendment, but none of us want to discuss the violent video games our kids are playing. We have a lot of opinions about the sex being peddled through the media, but none of us want to talk to our daughters about modesty. Every single one of us thinks we can solve the national debt crisis, but none of us want to sit down with our spouse and establish a budget. Yeah, this, this is the stuff. It's like, let's not go there. And what Paul is saying is, yeah, but the courageous and the fruitful and the effective and the ones who honor God and get the most out of the life he died to give us, they stop trying to control the world and they stop masquerading with a bunch of character signaling, right? And virtue signaling. And they just focus in on their home. How can we apply these things to our household? How can we live this out? And Paul's saying, when you embrace this type of new life and demeanor in Christ, your entire approach to the home looks different. And I know it's counterintuitive and I know it's countercultural, but you might find that you're crawling towards life, not towards death. And you might find yourself escaping the avalanche of this world. And here's the thing. If you walk away feeling shame from today's conversation, I have failed you as your pastor. And clearly, I have not communicated this message the way God communicated it to me. And so I apologize for that. Because what we should walk away with is this confidence that if God can bridge the biggest gaps within our society and our world, he can bridge the gaps within our home. And here's the deal. In the same way a church and the world is filled with imperfect people, it's the one thing we all have in common. In fact, being a sinner is a prerequisite to being a Christian. Think about it. You can't be a Christian until you acknowledge you're a sinner. It's a prerequisite. So let's get over it. We're all gonna make mistakes. And I have made some notorious ones. And it's learning to not hold on to your shame because God's not holding out on his grace. And it's learning to just walk humbly, repent, ask for forgiveness, apologize. And I've had some moments that are just super embarrassing. And Chris and I were talking about one this last week and you know, there was this time my son Cannon was about six or seven years old. He was at an age where he should have known his alphabet. And the school was letting us know, your kids should know his alphabet. And he was just having a hard time. 26 letters, he couldn't get them done, and it was becoming a thing. So one day, I, I get in one of those parent modes. I'm going to solve the issue. We're going to figure this out. Son, you're going to sit down. Get out the worksheet. You are not getting up from the seat and you are not playing with any toys or any friends or going outside until we finish this assignment. And so we sit there, and he's in the chair, worksheets in front of him. I'm hovering over him, and he just cannot get these letters right. And I'm starting to get frustrated and flabbergasted, like, what in the world? And I'm starting to talk to him about effort and giving it some a try, and I start to notice that, like, he's not even paying attention looking all over the place. And so now I'm lecturing my son on focus. 
like self-diagnosing him. Does he have ADHD? Does he have ADD? Buddy, just pay attention to the paper in front of you. There comes this moment where I place both of my hands on the side of his head. And the side of his head, he only has one. And <laughs> I hold it and I say, buddy, just look at the worksheet. What are the letters? And still couldn't get it right. A few months later, we're sitting in an optometrist's office. Doctor comes in and is like, well, your son has terrible eyesight. He has a severe astigmatism. I said, well, what does that mean? I have perfect eyesight. My wife has perfect eyesight. My oldest child has perfect eyesight. This is the first human being in our family who can't see well. What's astigmatism? They said, well, astigmatism is the curvature of the eye. It means whatever object he's looking at near or far is either blurry, double vision, right? And it says the curvature in the eye creates shadows around what he's seeing. And she says, have you ever noticed that when he's trying to focus, he's moving his head all around like this? She said, yeah, what he's trying to do is find an angle to see what's in front of him. And here in this moment, I'm like, what? A lousy dad. Thank you for clapping. <laughs> You're terrible. <laughs> I love it. I, I mean, I just thought to myself, buddy, I owe you an apology. I, I've got to repent. Like, dad totally dropped the ball. Here I am making you feel lousy in, in your education, and it's dad missing the mark. And, you know, Kristen and I, we always ask our kids before we share a story from the platform, hey, do we have permission to share the story? Would you feel comfortable with this? And I was telling my buddy, hey, do you remember this time, whatever? And he's like, you can share it. Be honest with you, I actually don't even remember the story. <laughs> to which I was like, crap, I just reminded you of the situation. Now you're never going to forget it. <laughs> I shouldn't have said crap from the platform. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, but, but maybe that's it. Maybe the beauty of it all is repentance, forgiveness, for, you know, just apologizing, taking ownership, walking humbly, what it does is it just opens the door for God's redemptive nature to just bridge the gaps in the brokenness of our families. And I know there's a lot there you can talk about. Hey, wives, submit to your husbands, which I think there's a kicker out there getting canceled for something along these lines. And I think we read this stuff and folks, we take it way out of context. We misinterpret it. We poorly apply it. It hurts women and then it hurts men. And we've become so binary in our thinking that it's either or, one or the other. And so for one person to do well, the other person has to be attacked. And it has to come at the expense of somebody. Nonsense. The word submit there is a borrowed Greek military term speaking of rank within the military. It literally means to stand under. To, it says, and wives need to, at moments, stand under in a posture that understands their husband's attempt to try to lead well. That's what it is. What it's not saying is exclusively across the board, men are better than women, and women should always support the men in every context, in every nonsense. You'll never find that anywhere in the Bible. God says, only within the family unit, my family and your family, do I like there to be some order? Because life's gonna come with pressure and life's gonna come with inconvenience. And when there's a moment where a decision has to be made, what would happen if the wife looked at the husband and said, I've got your back and I trust you? And here's the problem because men, come on somebody, have failed to rise up, become the priest of our homes like we're called to be, taking culture's lie that we're only here to provide the bacon what has happened is, is we have shrugged the responsibility to be caretakers, nurturers, and developers within our home. And so we've lost the trust of an entire gender to lead well. And this is a voluntary. This is not saying that every decision has to run through the man. It's, it's so poorly applied. It's just to say, hey, I understand you're trying, and, and I believe. And, and part of marriage is me loving you into your potential. I see the priest of God in you. I see the leader you're trying to be. And I understand the critical importance of your role within this home. The other day I was teaching my kids to play chess and they're asking me about the different pieces. What does this one do? What does this one do? And they're like, dad, what does the queen do? I was like, man, the queen can do whatever she wants. <laughs> she can move however everyone else moves. Like, oh, that's awesome. 
What can the king do? Really nothing. I said, kids, here's the deal. When it comes to chess, the queen is a lot more impressive than the king. But you take out the king, game over. You take out the role of men and fathers within our society, game over. Over. It's not to say women are not impressive. It's not to say that their role is not really wonderful and needed. It's to say that men still have a critical role to play. And what's interesting there, he says, here's, what's the, here's what the man's relationship needs to look like with the wife. Here's what the man's relationship needs to look like with the kids. And here's what the man's relationship needs to look like with anyone else who enters this home. It's an invitation for us men to just say, I'm not just gonna be a provider. I'm going to be a priest and I'm going to lead within a home that garners the trust and the respect of those I get to lead. And I would just say, if you're not single, please do yourself a favor and do not say I do and sign up for a lifetime in a relationship with someone you don't respect and trust. You're just gonna create a ton of heartache for yourself and for the other person. Marriage is not a casual decision. And Christ is saying, if you embrace the gospel, your house will look different. And that's the goal, amen?